अथ चैत विम धर्म्यम संग्राम न करसी तत स्वधर्म कीर्ति चिवा पापम वापस दिस इज श्लोक नंबर थर्टी थ्री फ्रॉम चैप्टर टू ऑफ भगवद गीता हिय भगवान कृष्ण से टू अर्जुन बट इफ यू विल नॉट फाइट दिस राइच इज वॉर देन हैविंग अबैंड योर ओन ड्यूटी एंड फेम यू शैल इन कर्सन With few notable exceptions this has rarely been followed in our post 1947 foreign policy other strictly indic guidelines are also largely missing namaste and welcome to tfi post i am your host sabita mishra if you're watching us on youtube please subscribe and press the bell icon to get all the latest updates if you're watching us on facebook to like share and follow the page let's begin More than four decades of his diplomatic life tells Jay Shankar that it is tough to beat Bhagwan Krishna and Bhagwan Hanuman on a strategic chessboard. He hails both of them as omnipotent, but being omnipotent is never enough. In order to be diplomatic, one should know when to wield the iron fist and when it is a time to remain silent. For strong silence is not weakness; instead, it is a virtue and a sign of strategic autonomy. Citing Shishupal incident, E. M. Jay Shankar explained how Bhagwan Krishna waits for the right occasion to thrash Shishupal, who was hell bent on insulting him. He said, "I quote: Today we say we need to demonstrate strategic patience. The best example in this regard, perhaps, was Lord Krishna. How he tackled Shishupal, he forgave a hundred times, and then you know what happened." Bhagwan Hanuman's case is not different. He was capable of killing Ravan and the whole of Lanka himself. Nevertheless, it would be inappropriate for him since it was not the part of his charter. Even when he burnt Lanka, it was because of Ravan's insistence on burning his tail. In both these instances, the onus of breaking the morally established boundary fell on the another party. Both these gods just retorted back only to re-establish dharma. External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar made no bones about the fact that he was referring to Pakistan while citing these examples. He also traced the similarity between modern day geopolitical issues and ancient India. One of them is the multipolar world. Even at that time, few kingdoms were with Kauravas, few were with Pandavas while many remained non-aligned. Jay Shankar summed up his analysis by stating that every top 10 geostrategic concept has its traces in Mahabharat. That is some refreshing reading of India's glorious history. It is sad to point out that this has not been the norm in the south block of New Delhi. Even after we gained independence, we never really emphasized on the Indic way of dealing with geopolitical tensions. It has its roots right in the education system. University education does contain a bit of education about Indian philosophers, but that is merely formality. The concept of weaving India's past in the modern frame is absent. Even in international relations syllabus of UPSC CSE exam Indic literature finds no mention this is an absolute mockery of our glorious past think about it to be foreign service officer you do not need to be an expert on philosophical underpinnings of past indian rulers dealing with similar situations part of the reason this censorship prevails is because it is not trendy to use indian text for citation Our academic conferences are highly dominated by political lexicons of western philosophers not doing that puts someone at the risk of offending bosses western philosophers and ideologies are not wrong in full picture but forgetting our own is a serious negligence despite that few of these officers studied and kept debating and deliberating on our history esteemed ones like jay shankar made it to the top purely on the basis of merit He is doing a tremendous job by putting forth India's glorious traditions in front of its own people. Only one question is puzzling. It's understandable that using Indic jargon won't fetch points on the global stage. However, it is tough to understand why these voices were suppressed in domestic circles.